Good morning. The date is June 18th, 2021 at roughly 10 a.m. and we're in the Senate chambers of the Kansas State House in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, there's some work going on in the House chamber, so we're conducting the interview in the Senate chamber. And I've, I've got to ask this, and I've been asking uh, some of the others that we've talked to. Uh, so you're here in the Senate chamber. Was there ever a dream of yours to maybe serve in this chamber? Not <laughs> a real, no, not a strong dream, I don't think. I, I had my six terms in the House, and by the time <laughs> I did that, you know, I didn't. Th I don't think I wanted to come across the rotunda. But. Okay. I'm Alan Conroy, and I'm a 40-year state employee with the majority of that time uh, of state service working in the Kansas Legislative Research Department, the central uh, nonpartisan research and budget staff for the legislature. I'm currently with the Kansas Public Employees Retirement System. And today I'll be interviewing former Representative Janie uh, Aylward, who served 12 years in the legislature. She first served in the, in the 1979 legislature and then serving the next six terms representing either the 73rd, I think, or the 74th uh, district, which is composed part of uh, Saline County, and then either Ellsworth, which was in the 73rd, and then I think Dickinson, which was on the 74th. And I think there was a little reapportionment uh, maybe in there, so we can uh, talk about that too when, when we get there. But, um, so I'll be conducting the interview on behalf of the Kansas Oral History Project, uh, a not-for-profit corporation created for the purpose of interviewing uh, legislators. The interviews will be made accessible to researchers and to educators, and the interviews are funded in part by a grant from Humanities Kansas. The audio and video equipment is being operated by former speaker pro tem David Heinemann. So, former Representative uh, Aylward grew up on the family farm in Saline County, if I remember right. You went to Sacred Heart High School in yeah. Salina, and then you attended uh, Kansas State and received her degree in animal science and in industry. Uh, she did some work on a master's in business administration at Washburn. Um, she, uh, of course, is a rancher and a sock woman. Um, she served on the Kansas Board of Tax Appeals following her legislative service. And she's also a certified uh, public accountant um, and has a successful practice in, in Salina in, in that area. When she was in the House, she served on numerous committees, uh, Agriculture and Livestock, where you were vice chair, uh, Fed and State Affairs, where you were vice chair, uh, Assessment and Taxation, and later on just became Taxation, uh, and then uh, computer, or Communications, Computers and Technology, uh, Economic Development, vice chair, uh, and of course, legislative, judicial, and congressional apportionment, which must have been some interesting times there. And then some joint committees, special claims, administrative rules and regs, the Joint Committee on Communication, Computers, and Technology, and then the Joint Committee on, on uh, Economic Development. So let's start with a little uh, background, and so, um, and we'll talk a little bit about your life before you got uh, to the to the legislature. And so you were born in Saline County, um, grew up there. I saw you were very active in the local 4-H uh, program, oh, yes. uh, and that was time well spent in the 4-H program. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I um, in 4-H because most kids get out of it when they graduate from high school. I think they had to throw me out when I was <laughs> finished my freshman year in college because I got to show cattle there oh. and I loved to show cattle. And Successfully? Yes, I did. Yeah. I had the grand champion oh. a few years and actually I still have a cow herd, mm -hmm. cow calf, and the way I got it started when I was in high school showing cattle, I had the reserve grand champion one year and the grand champion one year with Charlet, which were yeah. pretty exotic at that time <laughs> um, and kind of caught the eye of some local some Kansas Charlet ranchers who then hired me to show their oh. cattle one year I had 17 head of cattle that I took to Denver and mm -hmm. Wichita and showed them for different people and learned that the way I could break that many to be ready to show was with donkeys, so I had two donkeys that I could hook them up to, and they would, they would train my cattle wow. to. You could hook a thousand-pound yearling bull up uh -huh. to a donkey, and, and that little donkey would, would teach it to lead. <laughs> but long story short, I got my cowherd started that way because I had a very, far, very smart farmer father, mm -hmm. who at the end of the summer would tell them, 
don't pay her, give her heifers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't spend those. So I, and he kept saying, Janie, that'll make a really good house down payment for you someday, which I never did because I've always kept my cows and just kept them going. Of course, I don't have any of the same ones anymore, right, yeah, but, yeah. but I have their babies yeah. that have gone on. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned your father. So um, had any of your family been involved in politics before you decided to run run for the house? Not really. I, I did have a, my aunt's husband was an attorney in Salina who served a term or two in mm -hmm. the Kansas house. They had before all of this moved on to California, mm -hmm. so they were in California, but I really hadn't had any close relatives. I had an uncle that was on the county commission mm -hmm. in Ottawa County, which was next to us, a good Democrat on the county commission <laughs> who stuffed a lot of mailers for me oh. when we did direct mail. But. That whole uh, blood being thicker, uh, nothing's thicker than blood in terms of helping, you know, a f fellow no, member of the family. <laughs> it is an interesting quirk, though, because the first time I ran, Ellsworth County was in my district, and the Democratic, the Democratic Party chairman out there, his name was Paul Aylward. The uh, same as mine. Oh, my. And Paul <laughs> had run for Congress as a Democrat, very active, you know, big Democrat in the state. And when I'd go door to door out there, people would say, oh, are you Paul's daughter? Or they would tell him, well, Paul, your daughter was here. And he actually ran an ad in the paper the saying that he wasn't related to me. So, <laughs> I don't know whether that was good or bad, but I, I may have gotten a little credibility from his name at that point. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that first time you ran, uh, I think when you, in the primary, you were 21 years of age. Correct. And so and then when you took the oath of office and were successful, you were 22, so certainly one of the youngest or younger individuals to ever serve or I guess get elected. Yeah, that at that point I have not kept track. At that point I was the youngest woman to mm -hmm. have been elected. I think I would have been the youngest except the year I came in there was a representative elected in Wichita named John Sullivan mm -hmm. who was maybe 20 Mm -hmm. I know that he wasn't old enough to drink at the cocktail receptions. <laughs> I do remember that. So he was under 21, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. he was, you know, he was quite young when he came in. Yeah. Eight, 18, very young. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, you're developing that interest in politics then? Uh, I, I guess, yeah, was that just something you always thought about doing, one to do, or really, found it, it wasn't. I graduated from K State with a degree in animal science, and was farming with my. And really, had just graduated in mm -hmm. May, but was you know my intention was to farm, and mostly I was interested in the cattle end with uh, with my dad. And I came from a family where we'd always been involved in the community. My dad had been pre uh, chairman of planning and zoning mm -hmm. board and, you know, things like that had not run further, but um, he belonged to a group called Saline County Taxpayers Association who were, you know, not real radical. They were just farmers interested <laughs> in property taxes, as all farmers are. Um, but at that time, our state representative decided to run for governor, someone named John Carlin, whose name you'll probably know. <laughs> and so it left an open seat. And I remember my dad would go to meetings and come back and they were trying to find a candidate. And you know, it's hard because especially with farmers, they're so busy working and, and if they have cattle, they can't get away during the winter. So they were really having a hard time finding a candidate. And I still remember I walked out one day and I said, you know, Daddy, I think I've solved your problem. And he said, what's that? And I said, I'm going to run. <laughs> and what was his reaction? Well, I don't that? know after he picked himself up. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those cases where it's, it's when you don't know what you don't know, yeah, right. it's a good thing. Because <laughs> if I'd known what I didn't know, I'd have probably never done it. But I ended up with a three-way primary. Yes. And visited every door in the county, door to door, um, and then did it again for the general elections. Yeah, yeah. So. And you think that's part of the success other than maybe some name, but uh, I guess willing to make that commitment that to go door to door, I mean, that's gotta be a, t a terribly big commitment of time and it effort. It is in a rural district <laughs> yeah. because you drive door to door to all those farmhouses. And I do think that that was a lot of it. 
I met some wonderful people in Ellsworth County, I mm. mean, Ensling County. Mm -hmm. I think probably my family's uh, history in Saline County, mm -hmm. my dad's prior involvement. And I don't discount my involvement in 4-H. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get to know everybody right. in the county in 4-H. So, yes. you know, and I had been pretty active, mm -hmm. you know, in it. So, sure, sure. Um, yeah. you know, I think all of those factors kind of played into it. Yeah. Yeah, and luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you mentioned there were two primary opponents, uh, Oliver Hag, maybe, and Hague. Jesse Mag Magania. Magania. Uh -huh. uh, and you won with 56% of the vote in the three way primary. And then in the general election, you beat Jeff King and you received 62%. Uh, of the vote, so, uh, and, and I thought it was interesting um, in the next, so in all the subsequent elections, you never had a primary opponent. Um, you were, uh, uh, so I think that says something about maybe <laughs> people, if you don't, um, you know, and of course then in the general elections, what, in 1980, uh, you beat a gentleman by the name of Gary Hawk. Hawk. Uh, 72 percent of the vote. Hopefully, yeah. Um, 82. Keith Hall, 67 percent of the vote. Uh, 84. Herb uh, Petrasic. Petrasic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and you got 82 percent of the vote that time. And then in 86, you didn't have any general election, which must have been nice to not. <laughs> that was, you know. Uh, but I still went door to door because oh, you, you have to stay in touch. Yeah. I don't think probably as much, but yeah. uh, I mean door to door right. quite as yeah, much. Yeah. And then your last election, 88 uh, general election, you beat Alan White with 62% uh, of the vote, so. Yes, and those kind of numbers, and thankfully I had a good district with good people, you know, and, and wonderful to work with. Those no numbers end you, land you on the federal and state affairs committee where you get to deal with all of those crazy oh. issues. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that first support, uh, that first election, do you remember, oh, I don't know, kind of the campaign effort or what, you, was it mainly just door to door or was it, I don't know, flyers or mailings or, I don't know, radio ads or whatever it may have been to... Um, it was a little of everything. I would say that the the base was door to door, mm. you know, and God bless my mother who <laughs> went door to door with me wow. everywhere. Uh, I learned how much she loved me at one house where <laughs> I went up to the door and I was trying to put a flyer in the door and the people, it was out in the country mm. and the people that lived there, the, the, the wife was down at the barn with her horses and here came their Rottweiler. Uh -oh. And I was on the porch with a Rottweiler standing on the edge of the porch, barking and mm. growling at me. And there was a, a, they had a glass storm door and I was thinking, I wonder if I can crash through that door. And I thought, well, no, the dog will come through after me, so I can't do that. And my mother got out of the car and started waving at the dog saying, here, boy, here, boy. And I thought, my mom loves me. But the, the owner came up and got the dog. But that, I mean, I'm a dog lover. I have three of them, but that was a little scary. Yeah. Um, but in that first election, I would say door to door, you know, that was back before social media. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did some things like little teas in little mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. um, we did radio, mm -hmm. um, quite a bit of radio, newspaper ads, right. just the you whole. Spend very much money? Or you have any idea what you may have spent back oh, then? Oh, I would have election? to look back at my reports, but I <laughs> Which bet... you probably have. <laughs> oh, I probably do. Uh, I'm guessing in that first election, I'd be surprised if we topped $5,000, yeah. you know. Um, I think by the time I got to the last one, we were more around 20, 20 but yeah. um, again, I would have to look at those. Those are just, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so you talked about, you know, kind of politics in general, but were there any mentors uh, maybe uh, that maybe inspired you to think about running for office? Either um, you know, at the national level or maybe state, state level or even local level that somebody that, I guess, left an impression, uh, somebody in public service maybe that when you were growing oh, up? Oh, you know, I mean, there were a number of people. I, Karen Graves in Salina, who is the 
cousin-in-law of <laughs> Bill Graves, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Karen, Karen was mayor mm. um, when I was in high school or college. Right. And, you know, I think Karen had, because she showed that you could you do, do it, it. Right. and was very active in the local community. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, Nancy Kassebaum, I always have, mm -hmm. you know, held very highly, but she actually ran the same year I did, oh, uh -huh. which I have to say may have been part of my campaign strategy because people got us confused and they would think <laughs> that I was Nancy Kassebaum and it's like, that's good, yeah, that's you know, like, yeah. I can go with that, so, um, but, um, you know, I, she definitely was someone who kept me inspired to mm -hmm. continue to run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's neat. Um, so you got elected to the House, 22. A uh, number of women in the House, uh, I mean, was... Very few when, well, prior to 1979, when I was installed, uh, we were visiting about that a little bit before this started, because I was trying to remember if there was a Republican woman in the House, and there was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Belva Ott from Wichita, who was yeah. chairman of the elections committee. She was in charge of all things elections. Um, and then there were, I believe, three or four Democrat women, four, three, I think. And then Norma Daniels from Wichita was in the Senate. So there were not yeah. many. Um, in my class that came in, I think we decided there were four women that came in. Mm. So we doubled the House yeah. <laughs> women at that point. Yeah. Uh, we were better off than the Senate women because we had our own bathrooms. So there was something <laughs> to be said for that. There were enough of us. Um, but yeah, yeah. yeah there, there were not, not a lot of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just, I just uh, printed out, and, and these weren't all people, of course, that got elected in the House the same year you did, but were in the House when you, you arrived. And just, you know, looking down some of the names, uh, you know, Jim, Jim Allen, um, of course, Marvin Barkas, James Braden, Bill Button, Denny Burgess, uh, Rochelle Chronister, uh, you know, Lur uh, Larry Ernie, uh, Ben Foster, Robert Fry, Lee Ham. I mean, uh, David Heineman, yes. um, you know, late, uh, Wendell Lady, Charlie Laird, uh, Kenny King, James Lowther, Lloyd Polson, um, John Solbach, John Sutter, Larry Turnquist, um, Fred Weaver, Bill Wisdom, um, Eric Yost. I mean, really in terms of a group of individuals, there's some uh, pretty interesting and uh, I guess Certainly some people that were certainly uh, dedicated to public service, I guess, and you, you joined a, a good group, I guess. From they that. were a wonderful group of people. I mean, I and coming in at 22 years old, I'm not sure I, as an outsider looking in at politics now, I'm not sure I would have survived that, but it, I survived <laughs> it because of the people that mm -hmm. I was surrounded by that yeah. were just, we had a group of states people who, would argue like the devil on the floor of the house over things, but you know, you could walk out of there and be friends. Yeah. And I thought that was so important. And there's still a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, sure. I look across the room here now at my friend Joan Wagner, who we don't <laughs> ever sit on the same side of the aisle, but I consider, you know, I think we could probably talk about any kind of politics, but in those days, it just seemed like we could really put that aside. Yeah. And, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, one question I always ask, the first time you went to the well, the microphone, first time you carried a bill and you went down to the front of the house chamber and looked out at those 124 faces and you may have had a bill to carry or a motion to make. Uh, do you remember <laughs> that? You know, <laughs> I don't remember. It was something out of the ag committee <laughs> that I carried. I do remember it was an ag bill because I believe Bill Beasley was chairman of the Ag, big old, but he had the biggest hands yes. I've ever seen on anybody. He was a college football player, but Bill gave me some innocuous little thing to carry, you know, that nobody yeah. was going to argue about. But it, it was pretty terrifying <laughs> to walk down there and look out at all those faces and the first time or yeah. the second time. But uh, 
you know, I got through I that say, because you, you he gave me well. something easy. <laughs> so, yeah. and we kind of worked our way up to, yeah. I, back in the mid 80s, when we were dealing with all of the sin issues in federal and state affairs, I still remember R.H. Miller was chairman mm -hmm. at that point, and he walked up to me and he said, hey, Janie, do you want to be famous? And I said, for what? And he said, <laughs> we need somebody to carry the lottery which I wasn't even a big fan of the lottery, <laughs> but it was a constitutional amendment and right. I thought it needed to go out there for people to vote on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was a big growth from that little <laughs> innocuous <laughs> bill that did nothing to yeah. that. So we spent a lot yeah. of time on the floor that day. Oh, I bet, I bet. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, you served on some interesting committees, Ag and Livestock, Assessment and Taxation, uh, Economic Development, the communication, computers, and technology. Any of those were maybe your favorite? Or I don't know, maybe that's, if you can pick a favorite one, but one you enjoyed a lot, maybe? Well, you know, I mean, I got to chair communications, right. computers, and technology. So, you know, that was, that was interesting. We were in the infancy of all of the technology stuff at right. that point. And, you know, that committee was created to kind of try to deal with that. I think it's evolved now into a joint committee mm -hmm. that and really it needed and it really needed to be really closely associated with ways and means oh. or appropriations mm -hmm. because it's so money driven. Right. But you know, we dealt with some policy issues and yes, that was, you know, that was interesting because I got to set the agenda and run that. Probably of course my heart's in ag, mm -hmm. so I loved the ag committee yeah. and that would, the early 80s were interesting times with the Ag Committee when we had so many farmers in trouble oh, yes. and the American Ag mm -hmm. Movement and, and all of that. But um, when it comes down to it, taxes, you know, I'm a CPA, <laughs> taxes, and, and, and we had reappraisal and classification and I moved with it to the Board of Tax Appeals mm -hmm. to where we dealt with the other side right, of right. it. So I really got the whole picture of that and I, you know, taxes kind of, as a CPA, tax right. is what I do. <laughs> Don't give me anything to audit. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't begin to do an audit anymore. <laughs> but, uh, so that, that would probably be my, yeah. my first love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, of course, during your time, you served under several speakers. Um, of course, Wendell Lady and Fred Weaver was minority leader. Uh, Mike Hayden, and then it was Fred Weaver, and then Marvin Barkas, and then James Braden, and, and then Marvin Barkas is the minority leader. Uh, your relationships with any of those people in leadership, did you, clearly if you were appointed chair of committee or some of those things, you, there must have been some confidence there in your ability? Well, or? I guess so. You know, I, 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 I would hope that um, because they, you know, Mike did appoint me to that, but my, uh, probably one of my, my mentors that I really looked up to and will always hold in very high regard is Jim Brighton. Mm. Jim was just my, my favorite person in leadership and I just felt like he was a statesman, he was a gentleman, but he, he treated people fairly, mm -hmm. he, he tried to work across the aisle and I just really like Jim Braden. Mm -hmm. I mean, thought so much of him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, coming in, and I think I have Jim to thank for some of my success, actually, <laughs> or what success I had. Coming in, when I was first elected, not only did I get through an election, but we had a hotly contested speaker race oh. between Bob Arbuthnot oh. and Wendell Lady. Oh, yes. And we just got lobbied to death on that. And I mean, here I was going, I don't even know what I got elected to. And now everybody wants me to go vote for a speaker. And, you know, I don't know how many people came to Salina to talk to me about, uh, you know, who I should vote for. Sure. And somehow, uh, Jim, because of who he was and how he was, gained my confidence. And I ended up kind of unexpectedly I should have been in the Arbuthnot camp because oh. they were the more rural uh -huh. camp, right. but I ended up in the Wendell Lady camp who won. Yes. <laughs> and it's always good to be on the winning <laughs> yes. side. So, and that kind of determined the path of sure. people that I, you know, yeah. 
worked with and yeah. was associated with. Yeah. So that was a very lucky vote coming in. And I was trying to remember how close the vote. Do you remember? Uh, when it, it was, was pretty close. I, it, I don't know that we had to have more than one ballot, though. I would oh, have to okay. look at well, that. That's hard. Yeah, I, sh um, I should have done but that. But it was, yeah. it was not... It, it was close, and there, it took a while for everybody to kind of calm down after yeah. that. There were some hard feelings yeah. over it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did a count or some help from the State Library and, and Mary Galligan and Mary Torrance, but sure. uh, bills and resolutions that you sponsored during your time, 12 years, and um, there were over 175 uh, during that time. Um, and, of course, two. some of them were resolutions... Uh, Honoring the Sacred Heart High School boys basketball team. Yes. Congratulating the Go KSU nice. marching band for being selected to perform at the Wembley uh, Cup Soccer Championship in England. You, um, of course, memorialized Congress uh, to rescind a ban on industrial homework. Or uh, There were lots of, you know, <laughs> memorializing Congress to do something or not to do something uh, during those years. Of course, resolution honoring the astronauts from the space Right, uh, the right. shuttle challenger, um, and, and then of course uh, honoring representatives who either passed away or or uh, retired: uh, Cliff Campbell, Harold Dick, uh, Richard Harper, Lane Hassler, Ed Rolfs, um, all, all of those. Uh, but it looks like the first bill that you had your name on was House Bill 2140, it had to do with taxation, and it was ad valorem tax relief to persons who owned a taxable. Uh, tangible property. So even that very first bill sort of out of the suit bill. was a tax bill. <laughs> was a tax bill. I thought you were going to say it was one for a tax exemption on railroad rolling stock. Well, <laughs> but yeah, because I do remember I had one of those because I had like the only only business that dealt with, with that uh -huh. in Kansas and oh. they weren't able to compete with oh. other states. But um, which got us into the whole sales tax exemption <laughs> thing that was, I don't think we've ever solved all that. Yeah, yeah. And just looking down through some of the years, some of the bills with your names on them, you know, uh, county road supervisors appointed by the counties. Of course, lots of taxation ones. Uh, number of uh, arrests not to affect promotion of highway patrol troopers. Uh, I suppose maybe with, I don't know, the Highway Patrol Training Center in Salina. Yeah, I'm sure that they probably had yeah. something to do with that. Well, and that was probably about the time that I put the bill in to try to put all of the law enforcement oh. centers at Marymount College, uh -huh. which David Kerr from Hutchinson was not my friend <laughs> for a while after that because I was trying to steal his law enforcement center. But it was a good idea, and you will note that the yeah, Highway Patrol, Patrol is now at Old exactly. Marymount College in Salina, exactly. so it just yeah. took a few decades yeah. Yeah. to get there. Um, licensure of Electricians, Professional Plumbers Licensing Act, Kansas Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, grant and aids to programs providing services, uh, to domestic abuse victims, death penalty, uh, school district income tax act, uh, Kansas Rail Passenger Preservation Act, um, insolvent banks, uh, state preemption of firearm regulation, state universities preparatory curriculum admission entitlement affected, farm animal research facilities protection act. Um, um, so quite a quite a, a range of topics, Riding. but tax, agriculture, uh, economic development, education. I think we're all certainly the themes as you look back through those, um, you know, 170 some bills. So it's uh, uh, you know certainly um, an interesting list of uh, bills that you put your name on. Well, um, kind of a mix, but I, you know, my district was kind of a mix because, well, it changed. I, I w was elected in one district and then we went through reapportionment mm -hmm. the next term. But the district that I ended up with that I had most of the time was a lot of the south end of Salina. So I had quite a bit of city and I had a whole lot of rural. rural. So, you know, I had people with all different, um, you know, it's not like, I had this little piece of a city where they tend to have the, a lot of the same concerns. So, you know, you kind of had to balance 
the mm -hmm. different demographics. Yeah, and that since you mentioned that that change in your district, uh, any sort of background or how you went from the whole well. Dickinson Ellsworth kind of thing? <laughs> that, uh, there might have been a little politics involved in that. <laughs> and we're a we <laughs> So what do you expect? But no, and you'd mentioned Jim Allen earlier, and. And Jim Allen, who was a representative that came in the same year I did and, and became a senator, was my best friend mm. during that reapportionment because, again, I was pretty young and didn't really understand probably all the impacts of reapportionment. But um, I had come into a House seat that I think the Democrats were pretty certain they were going to retain, and it was the governor's old oh, seat. I guess that's right. So governor it was Carlin. a little yeah. bit of an embarrassment to him because the democrat county chairman's son is who i beat oh. in the election and just a little backstory not that i ever looked like barbie <laughs> never did never thought i did but i still remember the the line of journal our local paper running a story about the two of us because he was a year or two older than me mm -hmm. oh, i was in law school down here and they called it the barbie and ken election <laughs> i don't think they could get away with probably that not anymore, today <laughs> but <laughs> but they did at the time. And I think, you know, I think there was a push from the second floor to try to get the district back. Um, so I went from all of Ellsworth County, which was a nice rural Republican county, and all of rural Saline County and just this little piece of the north end of Salina to lost all, I lost all, all of that. Ellsworth County. Got kept Saline County, they took away the part of Salina that I had and put me into the south end of Salina, which was a much more, well actually they took away kind of a Democrat piece of Salina mm. and gave me an independent piece of Salina. But then they moved me over to Dickinson County and gave me this L-shaped thing that was Solomon, which was a Irish, I'm Irish Catholic, <laughs> so it's an Irish Catholic Democrat hotbed. <laughs> And went south from there and then clear over to Harrington, which was the home of the Rock Island Railroad. Railroad. So I didn't have a lot of Republicans over there either. But what they didn't realize was that my dad was from Solomon. So all of those Irish Catholic Democrats were my relatives. So that one really didn't hurt Small me world. too bad. And I remember Jim Allen kept coming to me going, Janie, is this okay? Do you think you're going to be? I said, yeah, I think I'm okay. I'm okay with Solomon. I can do that. And I said, I'm just going to have to go live in Harrington and really. And there were wonderful people in Harrington mm -hmm. when I got to know. In fact, I used to be able to go back with Gary Shear, who became mm -hmm. lieutenant governor, and we would go judge their junior Miss oh. pageant. And <laughs> there was no place to stay in the school. Superintendent would have us stay with him and judge the pageant for several years. So, so Harrington was a great experience. Yeah. Uh, so. but, but yeah, there was some politics involved. But then once we got that switch made, I didn't have to go through another yeah. major Yeah. yeah. Wow. Of, so. <laughs> um, as you look back over your sessions then, was there any from a policy standpoint that was perhaps the most difficult or the challenge challenging i mean you mentioned some of the sin uh, gaming issues let's say a highway plan uh, the merger of uh, of the kansas college of technology and ksu it's kind of in there that yeah, which i was definitely on the wrong side <laughs> of back in those days i think we all opposed okay that. so we were just talking about international uh, training uh, for pilots program in, mm -hmm. in Salina there and I think you were involved in helping to get that and from what I heard at the time it was very very successful. Oh yes and you know I think you had mentioned um, or someone had mentioned at one point the the charge back then to get K-Tech in Salina mm -hmm. combined into K-State which I mean I, I have purple blood so wildcat through and through but at the time, you know, we didn't think it was a very good idea. I think our whole delegation dug yes. our heels in and said, oh, no, we don't want to do that. And thank goodness we <laughs> lost because that's a wonderful, wonderful facility and wonderful program. And, I mean, you can see the pilot training going on mm -hmm. and the, you know, the planes because we have that huge, beautiful airstrip yes. at Schilling. Uh -huh. um, and they have planes up and down all the time um, out there training pilots. It's just, 
it's an amazing yeah. facility. So I'm <laughs> so glad we lost, yes. and and I get to see purple in my hometown. Yeah. So that yeah. makes me happy too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, comprehensive highway plan, Highway 81, rural bridges. Um, must have been an interesting time to navigate that. Well, it was. I remember the '90s session is when we did a huge comprehensive highway plan, and that was. My Governor Hayden mm -hmm. uh, was really pushing for that. And in fact, that's the year that I knew that Keith Farrar was going to retire from the State Board of Tax Appeals. And that's really where I wanted to go because that was kind of the other side of the whole reappraisal mm -hmm. and classification. I knew that opening was going to be there. So I had talked to Governor Hayden about it and he had agreed that at the end of the session I could exit and be appointed but he said you can't tell anybody because you've got to stay here because I need that vote for the highway plan <laughs> and as it was I think we were on a call of the house with the 63-62 vote because I recall I believe Mike Peters from, from Kansas City who was always late <laughs> came in late <laughs> and, and, and cast the vote on that but um, and I liked Mike oh, he yeah. was just he yeah. was busy yeah. uh, but um, that was that was a really a real fight to get that done, and I'm glad that we did. And I mean, some of the highways in, of course, Highway 81 we benefit from mm -hmm. in my yeah. area, but you know, it's also very necessary as a north-south sure. uh, route. And you know, some of the super twos down in southeast Kansas, there were a lot of people killed there. That, and yeah. I actually lived in Holton for a while, oh, and so 75 <laughs> Highway was yeah. kind of a death trap too. That has been helped a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, w was there a particular session or, or maybe a topic issue that was perhaps the most difficult for you during your time, whether it was you were successful in terms of it, something happened or maybe you stopped something or something you wish that would have happened that, that didn't? Um... You know, I think probably from a voting standpoint and just being ripped asunder by your constituents who are all over the place. Right. The hardest vote for me ever was multi-bank holding companies. Oh. I had so many. I had large banks. I, the average person didn't care. Right. I mean, you could walk down the street and ask, and the average person just, I don't know, I yeah. want to be able to go to my bank and <laughs> yeah. get money if I need to. So, you know, they really didn't care. But people in the banking industry I mean, that was either all out yeah. for or just adamantly opposed. And I had a lot of small town small bankers banks, in yeah. my district. And I had some, you know, very large oh, sure. banks in my district. So they were just, I ended up with the small bankers who, again, <laughs> that's all changed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with time. But, you yeah. know, we, we tried to keep things local and, and I still happen to like my little local bank. <laughs> so I still yeah. do that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but I think that was probably the most difficult. The other difficult issues were, um, a lot of them that we handled in the federal and state affairs mm -hmm. committee because they were so emotional you know because we i mean we really had my hat goes off to rh miller who chaired during that time because we had paramutual wagering lottery liquor by the drink you know and yeah. then we always had of course the abortion issues yes. and and we had reverend taylor mm -hmm. <laughs> who was who was ever present that yeah. um you know was a very very much a force uh but we had those issues and on that committee the abortion issues were tough for me because mm -hmm. i'm catholic mm -hmm. you know so i had a lot of catholics that were but i happened to be on the other side of that issue right. so you know those were those were those were kind of yeah. difficult yeah do you think in terms of your service i mean kind of that philosophical thing do you represent your district district or what your constituents want or do they send you and then you get to decide once you're uh, elected and take the oath of office? I think it's a balance mm. because I can't, you couldn't vote right. with all of your constituents because no two of them <laughs> had exactly the same opinion. You know, I'd have had to have been able to cast 22,000 <laughs> votes if I were going to do that. Um, I don't think 
it would have been wise to come and just say, if I had 90% of the people wanting one thing and saying, oh, no, I know better than you do, yeah. I'm going the other way. But I think there's education involved where, you know, we used to do, we did a lot of mailings, mm -hmm. we had a lot of, you know, we'd have the meet and greets mm -hmm. on Saturday mornings, sure. the legislative coffees yep. and, and breakfasts and stuff where we could talk about things and say, you know, I know you think you're in favor of this, but here, yeah. here's the rest, <laughs> here's of, the the rest of the story. And you need to know the rest of the story. You know, the hardest things, I think, were when you'd get a bill that sounded like, I, re I remember, and I can't remember what got hung on it on the floor, but we had one that was the uh, sales tax exemption on farm equipment mm. that hit the house floor. And somebody got an amendment on it that was just horrible. I mean, I, you know, I just couldn't vote for it. So I ended up voting against yes. a sales tax exemption mm. for farm equipment. And all of a sudden, in the next election, I was anti-farmer. Yeah. <laughs> so not. then I had to go round up several of the farmers in the community and say, would you do a radio ad I'm saying sorry, that I'm really not against farmers? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so those, those were... Those were kind of touchy things. Oh, I bet. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Governor Hayden. And so when you were in the legislature, it was, uh, started out uh, Governor Carlin and yes. then, then Governor Hayden. I don't know. And particularly since you took Governor Carlin's seat. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, any relationship? Uh, I guess, of course, you were in the legislature with Governor Hayden, but relationships with the either one of the governors during that time? Or? I can't say I had a close relationship with Governor mm -hmm. Carlin. Of course, I was a very junior member, <laughs> right. and probably I did take his seat. But he did have, his, his aide was Jamie Schwartz mm. from Salina, uh -huh. and Jamie graduated from Sacred Heart High School a number <laughs> of years ahead of me, but actually his sister, Mary, was in my class. So I did kind of have mm -hmm. an association with the governor's yeah. office through Jamie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, but I really probably early in my career, there wasn't a lot of influence that I would have commanded. Yeah, you know, you kind of have to come right. in and get your feet wet and sure. sit in the back row and shut up <laughs> um, for a while. But um, with Governor Hayden, I mean, yeah, he was, uh, I thought Mike Hayden was terrific. Mm -hmm. And, you know. And an eff effective the uh, leader, I think? I thought a very yeah. effective speaker of the house. Mm -hmm. And, and I, yes, I thought Mike was a very effective governor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his management style in the house, was it? Uh... Well, you knew <laughs> if you weren't doing what Mike wanted done. <laughs> um, and, and he would tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, as I'd mentioned earlier, I thought Jim Braden was mm -hmm. just, and Jim would have been calm. Right. Mike would tell you. <laughs> but, you know, I always kind of like it when I know no, where I'm at. Exactly so, right. you know, you didn't. And you would hear it in no, so, in no uncertain terms. I mean, I know that Mike's, you know, sayings have been cast. Oh, you know, right. everybody knows those. But I still remember we had um, Elizabeth Baker mm -hmm. from Wichita was in the house. She came in as a Republican, really was kind of a Democrat. You know, I mean, she crossed, she crossed the aisle a lot, and she was always in trouble with Mike Hayden because she was always, you know, teaming up and kind of going across the aisle, and she was definitely always in trouble. And I still remember she carried a bill one time that he was happy with, and Elizabeth, who you would, was very ladylike, mm -hmm. turned to him and she said, you know, Governor, or no, Mike, it was no speaker who was speaking then. You know, Speaker, doesn't that just make you happier than a gopher in soft dirt? <laughs> and coming from her, it was because that's something he oh, would have said. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she got to throw it back at him. <laughs> but, he, uh, but I think Mike was very effective, at least with me. Mm -hmm. He got his highway plan yeah, passed, right. which was huge. Right. So I think he, he did got a lot, get a lot of his agenda, you know, taken care of. I think, you know, his management style probably set, worked against mm -hmm. him with some yeah. people, but right. that's, that's who he was. Yeah. Yeah. And, you <laughs> yeah. know, and the whole property tax issue for him. was Well, you know, a lot of the property tax we worked through well, Jim Braden was was chairman of the tax committee, mm -hmm. 
when we were doing that and Mike was speaker and he supported us on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had to come in for special sessions yeah. to deal with that and he would call those in when we needed to do them because we were trying to stay out of the Supreme Court. <laughs> and you know, we all started out with that wanting what our Constitution said at the time, which was uniform and equal. But when we started looking at what uniform and equal had turned into, mm -hmm. we just ended up saying, okay, we've got to create some quasi-classification system to sort of say, this is generally where we are statewide and we're gonna cement that in and then yeah. not move from there. Yeah. And so he moved with us on that. Yeah. You know, it wasn't something we wanted to do, but we, we had to do right. it or else yeah. it would have been homeowners yeah. and farmers that would have, uh, yeah. businesses would have probably come down yeah, and, and, everybody, else and everybody else would have really skyrocketed. Yeah. yeah. As you look back over those 12 years in the legislature, is there one particular success or kind of proud accomplishment that you, I guess, really think the system worked, uh, something good has been done and I'm proud to be associated with the topic or the issue or? Oh, it's hard to narrow it down to one. I mean, or I think couple. that there are some, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, there were a, a little local one that I will review that I think was that I'm not sure you could do today oh. and get the legislature <laughs> to do. In my district, I had a thing called the Salina Indian Burial Pit. Yeah. which was this ancient Indian burial yeah. area that was comprised of, I think, three different tribes that a family on the ground, they had dug out all of the skeletons and had them kind of on display, uh -huh. and it was sort of a commercial enterprise. Uh -huh. And I was very familiar with it because growing up, that's how I'd give people directions to my house. I'd say, go east on 40 highway to the Indian burial pit sign and then turn north. So, you know, I didn't live very far from it, but it became an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, Haskell started to take issue with right. it as the tribes did, and, and I don't blame yeah. them. But, you know, it was one of those cases where what, what was going on there was legal in Kansas we could make it illegal and close it down, but then we had this family sure. that had had this business there for years and years, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and, and um, I can't claim, that I worked very hard on it, I cannot claim the credit for it because the Indian tribes had an attorney, and he was a Native American mm. gentleman who was amazing. Mm that came in and really worked with people. But I got the benefit on the other side of being able to go to some of their ceremonies oh, when uh -huh. they closed it, which were just a once in a lifetime sure. thing that I got to see. But we had to go to the legislature. Ultimately, we couldn't get it worked out to just close it. I didn't, you know, we didn't want to do that to the family right. because what they were doing back then, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, people's attitudes changed and it wasn't a yeah. bad thing back then. And we finally got the legislature to appropriate $90,000 for the family so that we could then. pay them and get it closed. And right. we set aside a period of time where things could be studied there and then it was capped with a concrete, mm -hmm. giant concrete cap. So you were talking about a success there. Any, mm -hmm. as you look back over your 12 years, any a big disappointment that Something that you wished the legislature would have? Well, I wish that they would have taken the law enforcement center out of Hutchinson and given <laughs> it to me in Salina, um, because I thought that Marymount would have been just perfect, perfect. for that. Yeah. But they, they won't do that. So I'm, I'm happy that we, we got that, a good facility for the highway patrol. Um, you know, I. I think I was on several committees where we went back and we looked at sales tax exemptions mm -hmm. and property tax exemptions, trying to close some of those holes. Yeah. And I, I wish we could make some progress there. I think that there are areas where progress can be made. It's just one of those, every time you get into them, there's a reason it was passed, yeah. you know, yeah, and, yeah. and there's so much yeah. pushback on that. I think just as a big picture, and I honestly can't remember all the details now, but I think a success, I'm kind of going back and yeah, forth no, on you, but no, I had to fine. think about this for a minute, yeah, yeah. 
a success that I think the legislature was very helpful with in the early 80s was helping our farmers mm. because we created a number of programs mm -hmm. to help them so that they could defer some payments and and um, you know hold off foreclosures and things like that because that's when we had tractors going to Washington mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and all of that so I think that we we were successful in helping them with that um, I was pretty opposed to the severance tax, and we still have it. Right. So that yep. was that was one thing that was a disappointment that we ended up with that. Yeah. But, but yeah. we've all survived yeah. it. I noticed one of your bills was on, I think, on taxation. It had to do with uh, parsonages and exemptions or not from from property tax. Uh, should the parsonage be exempt or not? Um, and so were you involved in that issue or involved in some hearings on that? Does that? Um, well, we had, we had a special joint house Senate committee that was dealing with that issue mm -hmm. one summer. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess maybe it was an, it wasn't an interim, it would have been an interim, interim committee, committee, I guess. Sure. But I remember we met, it, it was such, we had so much oh. going on with tax at that time. We met in the old well, Supreme, Supreme Court chambers, right. you know, it was so <laughs> crowded and we had so many people in there. Um, but I remember at the time we were dealing with that and one of the issues that came up because we had sort of a local celebrity, uh, Reverend Fred Phelps mm. came in to testify on it and I had found out that he had filed for an exemption on the swimming pool at his compound that he lived in as a baptismal font because that's where they were going to baptize people and took him to task on that which made him not happy at all. <laughs> um, so I was opposed to swimming pool <laughs> baptismal <laughs> fonts being exempt from property tax and, and I asked him about it and he tried to justify it and I don't think either one of us were ever satisfied with the other one but I don't think his baptismal font was ever <laughs> exempt from property tax and should not be. That's one of those big loopholes <laughs> yeah. that yeah and I don't think I was ever on his list of favorite people again yeah. or yeah. ever was but that's okay. Yeah. You know we don't all come to make friends with everybody. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, one uh, standard question we ask all uh, participants that are, are being interviewed, um, and it relates to uh, personal identity question. And so I'm going to read you this little statement and I'd like to hear any thoughts uh, you might have. But it says personal identity is loosely defined as gender, age, race, class, sex, sexual or gender orientation, marital status. Uh, did you experience times during your time in the legislature where you believe your personal identity influenced your ability to pass policy, work with fellow legislators, or provide constituent services? Do you think you were ever given committee assignments or tasks that you believe were functions of your personal identity? So, I mean, you, I mean, you talked about being a young person, uh, being uh, maybe not in the conservative, strong conservative mm -hmm. camp. Um, being a, when you first came, maybe only eight women legislators in, in the chamber. Um, you, you, I mean, did that, do you think that played in? Well, yeah, I mean, I think they all, all of them play into, you know, into it. Just like I think if someone came in and they are a, a Vietnam veteran mm -hmm. there or a military retiree that plays into it because there are experiences that they have but I understand I, I think what you're getting at I think to a degree it played into it I can go back to my my mentor Jim Braden mm -hmm. and Wendell Lady before him I didn't ever feel that I was not given a committee assignment mm -hmm because I was female right. or young. I mean, I walked in and I said, hey, now I didn't end up on the tax committee my first session, I think maybe the second session I got there, but the ag committee was my first sure. request and mm -hmm. you know, I got that, got that sure. um, and ended up on federal and state affairs, which, you know, if nothing else was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, yeah. I can't complain about that. I. Uh, just a little backstory, so wheel the clock back here a little, you know, a number of years, but I do remember 
when I first came in, and this 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 brings up one of your local Billy Bunton, Bill Bunton. <laughs> uh, when I first came in, I picked out a seat on the House floor, and there was a representative. I won't say where they were from or who they were, but apparently would not been a good fit for mm. me to be sitting next to mm. as this young. Mm -hmm kind of innocent 22 year old <laughs> and Wendell Lady saw that mm -hmm. and said because you know you know on the house floor it kind of the chairman will sit toward the front right. and seniority sort of sure. I don't know if it's still that way but it sort of dictated you know right. if you'd been there you could mm -hmm. kind of bump people out and move right. up and this individual had been there a long time and was sitting toward the back next to me and they saw that and said, oh, she's not going to survive this. This will not be good. <laughs> so I came in the next day and I had a new seatmate, <laughs> Bill Button. <laughs> they had talked to Bill. And here Bill was, I think, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee at that time. And he moved and sat in the back <laughs> with me so that I, because he had enough seniority right. to he move him moved. out. And Bill sat there with me for <laughs> two years until I kind of got my feet on the ground. Yeah. So I just had so much respect for Bill. And, and it says something about him. Most people would have to be in that front row oh, and yes. be in their right. chairman's seat. In general, I would say I felt that my committee assignments, I mean, I was given a committee chairmanship. I didn't feel like I was ever really treated differently mm -hmm. as a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe it was my expectation because I came from an ag background where I was, you know, in college, I was in animal science. I was a minority <laughs> there. So you were just kind of used to walking in and saying, hey, I'm here too. <laughs> you know, so I don't think I really felt that I had that. Mm -hmm. Probably because I was young and, you know, uh, I think some people kind of took me under their wing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Rochelle Cronister definitely right. took me under her wing, yeah. and I'm so grateful that I had Rochelle sure. there. Um, yeah. But you know, and after a while, you could kind of yeah. work away yeah. from that and and get a little age yeah. and experience. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was always very happy with my committee assignments. I felt like I was able to, you know, get bills run that right. I wanted to have yeah. run. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, during the 12 years. Do you think the legislature changed as an institution or the process or when you were first elected till that last term did or was it the legislature the house still sort of plotting forward and the the process worked or, or were there changes that you noticed uh there were definitely changes mm -hmm. um when i was elected we had a i don't remember our numbers but we had a pretty strong republican Right. majority in the House. Um, over the years, we began to see the emergence of the very, very conservative side of the Republicans. So rather than having, and really when I was elected, the big split was not Republican Democrat, it was rural urban. Mm. We had much more of a rural urban split than right. that, which made my district kind of difficult because <laughs> it was kind of both. But um, it became much more where we would see coalitions of all kinds of different groups emerging. Um, I think we had at one point about 17 or 18 of the Republicans that kind of split off that were the, you know, they called themselves the conservative Republicans. I remember Jim Braden keeping track of their votes on spending bills, and they voted to outspend us moderates about three to one because they were just trying to create havoc with us mm -hmm. most of the time. But, you know, they would take whoever they could get to team up with and kind of take on the moderate Republicans. So that became, um, you know, very, very difficult. And I know the Senate has changed a lot because. Back in those days, we were dealing with the liberal Senate. <laughs> so we conservative, more conservatives in the House would kind of have to stop things and not get it over to the Senate because we knew that those liberal senators would pass anything. But uh, I think that's a lot different these days yeah. too. But, but um, the, the Republican Party changed a lot while I was there. Yeah. Not so much the Democratic Party, yeah. I don't think. I, I did notice uh, 
after you were out of the legislature, uh, you were on a steering committee for Republicans for Kansas Values, mm -hmm. uh, a moderate Republican group opposed to tax cuts imposed by, at that time, Governor uh, Brownback. Uh, in 2014, you joined some other moderate Republicans endorsing Democrat Paul Davis uh, mm -hmm. for governor uh, over Brownback. Yeah. Um, difficult decisions there or stirred the pot quite a bit? Well, I mean, they were difficult decisions, but you have to look at Kansas. And I think the things that I am always proud of Kansas because of our investment in our in education at all levels, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I think we have some wonderful post-secondary colleges and institutions mm -hmm. here. Um, I think our infrastructure and our investment, you know, I mean, I, I'm always the first one when you cross the state line, it's like, oh, we're in Missouri <laughs> now, I can tell, you know, and I've always been proud of our, our road and highway system here. I think we've made the investments that we need mm -hmm. to there, and I just wasn't seeing that coming. You know, the tax cuts that, that Governor Brownback instituted were great. I mean, businesses loved mm -hmm. them. They were wonderful. And, you know, I have a business. Yeah, sure. I'll take money. <laughs> That's fine. But you have to be able to pay the bills mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And I just didn't think that we were able to do that. I don't think my toes quite as far over the line <laughs> with the moderate as some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's, you know, it was time to draw the line yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you ever see yourself returning to elected office of some type? Uh, oh, heavens no. <laughs> yeah, I heard Kevin Costner interviewed one time because somebody was asking him if he would ever run for office. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, oh, Lord, no, I've led a colorful life. I could never do that. And that's kind of where I'm at at this point. <laughs> My life has been colorful. I don't want to read about it in the newspaper. So I think maybe we'll just, we'll say I did my public service and I still get to give back to the community in a lot of ways. I'm on the, the foundation for this line of regional hospital board mm -hmm. where we do some really with all of Western Kansas, right. you know, yeah. so I can, can be involved that way. I've been very involved as president of the Rotary Club when we lived up by Leavenworth mm -hmm. and still involved in my Rotary Club yeah. And, yeah. and those things. So, you know, I think that part of my life has, yeah. but I would certainly get in and support the right candidate and yeah. Yeah. So if tell a person, them what to do. I was going to say, if a person <laughs> did come to you and say, hey, I'm thinking about running for the legislature, would you encourage them to run, do you think? Yeah. It depends on and the person. <laughs> but I actually, there are a couple in Salina right now that I've been looking at going, hmm, <laughs> I wish they'd kind of take early retirement and I could get them going toward the legislature. <laughs> we could use them there and they could get elected. Yeah. Um, you know, so I wouldn't say that I don't want to be involved at all, but I right. sure, you know, I've been busy in my own oh. business. <laughs> sure. And, you know, when you're in your own business like that, it's hard yeah. to, yeah. I can see my, you know, anybody that can run a business and make the commitment to the legislature now, it's, I'm glad they can do it. Otherwise it would just be a bunch of retired people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And retired people are good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we kind of need diversity. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, um, is there anything else maybe that I haven't touched on, or any issue you'd like to share share with us, uh, or any thoughts? Or oh, that's always the hardest question, and that's not anything <laughs> yeah. I thought yeah, about no, before fine, I came fine, here. Yeah. I know. I mean, I am. I am so blessed to have had the opportunities mm. that I had. And, and like I say, I'm glad that I didn't know what I didn't know or I would have <laughs> never done it. And, you know, the confidence of the people in my district that sent me back yeah. six times. Yes. And, and, uh, and my service on the Board of Tax Appeals, which was amazing. I mean, when I got over there after reappraisal, I think we had... 17,000 cases we were trying to hear. And that's when we would take a board member and a court reporter and an attorney and we would go mm -hmm. like stay in Independence, Kansas mm -hmm. for a week. And we heard every appeal. I still remember having, I remember being in Kansas City, Kansas hearing appeals where people would come in speaking some mm -hmm. other language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
had yeah, no idea a, what they were saying. Right. And when they get done, I'd turn to the court reporter and said, what did you put down for record? She said, I just kept typing, speaking foreign language, mm -hmm. speaking foreign, because, you know, you, could, that, you just yeah. couldn't hardly do those hearings. Or I remember one uh, in a small town where the people were telling me that the value of their house shouldn't have been what it was because it flooded. And when it flooded, they had to bring all the livestock in and they couldn't get the pigs back out of the house. And, <laughs> you know, you'd sit there just trying to, oh. okay. <laughs> You know, <laughs> keep a straight face. Yeah. But, and there probably wasn't were, worth a lot, but, you know, the board changed then to where we would get hearing mm -hmm. officers and, right. and not deal with all of those. But mm -hmm. we used to have days, I think there were over 50,000 decisions by local, um, mm -hmm. oh, you know, the county commissioners uh -huh. would hear appeals and we would have to read all those and approve them. Uh -huh. So we would just spend yeah. hours and hours doing, doing that. Yeah. So, you know, I think probably looking back, the whole getting Kansas tax system mm -hmm. up and running and getting to see the whole, right. the whole round uh, issue yeah. of it, yeah. you know, between... Yeah setting the policy and implementing the policy is probably, yeah, yeah, um, great, you know, yeah. what I like to look back yeah, on. Right. And it's tax. Yes. So I like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, that concludes our interview today with uh, former Representative Janie Elward and talking about her 12 years of uh, public service in the legislature and other service before and after uh, that legislative service. So we thank her for that. Uh, dedicated effort, effort of uh, public service and, and wish her all the best and thank her for spending some time with us today.